This is episode number 396 of the Inner Fight Podcast. We are joined on the line on Skype with audio, no video, because that slows everything down from the UK by Yami Tikkanen. Some of you might know that name. Those of you who don't will get to know it in the course of the show. Yami, thanks a lot for taking the time out to talk to us, mate. How's things down there in London? Yeah, things are good. I was just looking when we had the video that you guys have much better tan going on than I do. So clearly the weather is a little better up there, but... Trust me, I, I don't mean. <laughs> Andre, is, Andre has still... He's lived here for 18 months, mate, and uh, he's still not managed to get much tan on at all. <laughs> mate, you, you probably are one of Europe's household names of CrossFit. That's a big, bold statement, I know. But you've been in the game a long time, mate. Give us a little bit of a background when you got into CrossFit and how it started. Yeah, sure thing. So uh, I actually started um, 2006 when I was living in, uh, in Paris in France and uh, just kind, kind of randomly came across CrossFit on, online as I was doing martial arts and decided to give it a go. And... Um, Ended up having my ass handed to me very quickly by these workouts that looked so simple on paper. Um, that got me really curious about it. And then I moved to London later that year um, and started to train a little bit more systematically. Yeah. Um, as, as much as anyone was training back in 2006. So <laughs> it's kind of doing, doing, doing CrossFit.com workouts. And then I didn't have much equipment. So I figured that if I just do Cindy... Every week, I'll get better at it. So I end up having this period where I Cindy once a week for six months. Um, <laughs> I bet so, you don't do Cindy much more anymore, do you? <laughs> no. no. But so I got really good at it, but my deadlift was like 80 kilos. So I, I quickly kind of learned um, what my weaknesses were um, after that and started to go to the gym and kind of actually have access to weights and and kind of move on from there. Um, 2009, competed at the first uh, regionals mm-hmm. in Europe. There were um, 14 of us competing. Wow. But uh, one of us happened to be Mikko Salo, um, who did okay in 2009. <laughs> um, yeah, obviously. And, and, you know, I was, because he's, he's a fellow Finn, and uh, so we ended up warming up together at the beginning of the day. And I knew I was in trouble even during the warm up. I was like, really? you know, I dying, dying during his warm up. So, you know, that gave me a different perspective in, in how the training could be. Um, mate, can I just there, can I, can I hop yeah. in there, mate? Because I think that's it. For the the sure. sort of people that have been around CrossFit like for a while, Miko Solo has been a name. How was he so far ahead of everyone else so early in the game? I think that's that's something that's interesting. I'm, I'm keen to get your thoughts on. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think. You know, first of all, he came from a background where he had a solid base of endurance and, and he actually saw the value of training your aerobic system. And I think that was the big thing. It's like he had this foundation where he could put in the volume that other people were not able to touch. Yeah. And for, for me, I mean, I think Mikko changed the game more than anyone has uh, ever since in that, you know, he, he rocked up. Nobody knew who he was, but he had been hitting these two a days for years yeah. basically and uh, the, the building that foundation of it just just being able to get those 2009 games were brutal as well like one of the hardest frosted games right. just with the weather and the aromas and so many events and just like the type of events that they were so i think he showed up prepared to a competition that nobody else was really prepared for right yeah i i mean mate he was he was just on a different level from the start like you said and it just seemed that he trained differently than anyone else yeah i mean i I was obviously geeking out on everything crossfit at the time and and you know just really that first impressions from first workout at the regionals you know everyone who was there were like oh wow like this guy's gonna win the games this year it's like he was just untouchable um yeah it was it it was incredible cool so continue mate you're with him at regionals and he he's the man and there's only a few of you there. You must have been... What was that experience like? <laughs> you know, my, my, my fondest memories, um, when one of the heats, Mikko finishes his workout a couple of minutes ahead of everyone else, just random, like, casually walks to his bag, picks up a camera and takes some photos to have some memories. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, that was 
was kind of the name of the game. Um, but, you know, that was also my first CrossFit competition. So it, it was definitely a, a good experience for me. I learned a lot about pacing by, you know, going way too hard in the workouts that I could perform much better. And it, it was just everything was so new. You know, the sport wasn't really well defined at that time. So there was so much to learn. And at the same time, we had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> was there any big programs back then? Was there any programming organizations as we have today? Or was it just random training trying to figure out what to do yeah i mean i think that going back i mean mikko was training systematically i don't know if anyone else was doing much else than working out with the you know with their friends yeah. um, obviously people were fit but it was it seemed like a random, random approach um at the time I don't, i don't know if any programs that would have existed at the day yeah. um, so after regionals What happened? What was the next step? How did you get to where you are today, basically? Um, well, I mean, at the regionals, um, so I stayed in touch with Miko, and then in 2010, I was still finishing my school uh, in London, and um, he asked me if I would come to the regionals uh, with him. Um, I was starting to be an osteopath, so okay. he asked if I would go in and, and work as a manual therapist with him. Oh, um, wow. So I did. Um, and, and then... In those 2010 regionals, um, I saw Annie um, compete, and you know I think it's just a lot of raw talent. She was really, really good, but also she was really, really immature as an athlete in terms of her movement and in terms of what was possible for her. Um, so I saw that potential. I just kind of approached her and, and you know, you know, offered to help in her preparation for the games, and she was foolish enough to say yes. <laughs> Did you convince her with your Cindy times or? <laughs> 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 I don't know what I I, I I don't know what I convinced her with. Maybe it was good that I was working with Miko, you know, like so that gave <laughs> gave the impression that I had some kind of an idea of what I was doing. Yeah. Um but yeah, it was a big leap of faith from her part for sure. How how was it then, mate? Because nowadays like, you know, people can open a CrossFit gym and the models kind of try and test it, but you were almost in uncharted territory uncharted water like you know miko was just he was obviously he was a fireman right and it was just a it was a, i mean it still is a very amateur sport across it but it must have been a very interesting time you're just finishing studying and you're trying to figure out a way to make a living through this new concept of crossfit that must have been quite an interesting time and challenging as well it was but i think oh um At the time, it felt so obvious to pursue that. You know, I finished my degree in osteopathy, and then I never ended up practicing full time. I ended up kind of going straight to coaching from there and working with the athletes on an individual basis on osteopathy, but not, you know, not having my own practice or anything. And I, and it seems like that's that's the only choice to make. Um, I actually remember very distinctly being on a holiday trip in. in um, Barcelona in 2007 and taking a journal note of like, oh, it would be really cool to do this CrossFit thing, yeah, uh, like full time as a professional at some point. Um, and um, yeah, so it, it, it seemed really obvious. So it didn't seem so challenging yeah. um, at the time. Obviously, it was hard work, but it didn't. There was no like doubts about is this the right thing or anything like that. It what it was the right thing from the start, was it? Yeah, I mean. Yeah, definitely felt like that at the time and still yeah. does. Very cool, mate. What What was your first step to making it a revenue stream aside from working with athletes? You, you open your you open a gym in London, right? Yeah, that was the the very end of two thousand and nine. Right. And what uh, what was the motivation behind that? How did all that come together? Um, I was training at another gym. There was the. Um, CrossFit Central London was the first uh, CrossFit gym actual having a physical location in London. Yeah. Uh, there was CrossFit London before that, but they didn't have a physical location. So this was, that was close to my school. So I ended up going there to train, ended up coaching there. And then, you know, I've always kind of wanted to make my own way. So I was kind of like, oh, I have these thoughts and I want to go and do it this way. And uh, then found a group of people who wanted to open a gym and, and just kind of went went with it. And you, so it, you were basically the third CrossFit gym in London, is that right? Mm, yeah, or we might be second gym. We're the third affiliate, I think. Yeah. Um, but And the second place to have an actual physical location. Are you still involved in that now, mate? How has all that progressed? Uh, I'm still one of the owners, but I'm not really involved with the day-to-day -day operations at this time. 
So how does it? So what? So talk, talk us through now that sort of evolution because everyone knows you as, as Annie's coach. How have you worked and how have things evolved to where you're at now? And obviously, what we really want to jump into the training plan, which is a massive focus of yours, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. So so after that 2010 games, um, obviously Annie had great success already in 2010. So that kind of formed the trust between us as an athlete and a coach. And we continued to work from that. And initially, the, the next two years from there, there were a few people who approached me to work with me individually. And I started to work with a few athletes on an individual basis. Right. But I kind of quickly, around 2012, beginning of 2012, I realized that it's not really sustainable to work with as many people as who wanted to work with me. Um, so I kind of, it's all, almost like I put, put out the training plan initially in 2012 as this like very hard to follow, only use abbreviations. I wanted there to be a fee for people to pay so that there's a barrier to entry. So they would follow the program if they pay for it. Yeah. And, uh, I really didn't make it easy for people to follow at the beginning, but I still put it out there um, really as a means to develop my own thinking and to test the programming ideas that I had in a wider audience. Because I mean, it's not hard to make Annie better at that time. Now it's much harder because she's so refined. But at the beginning, she had so much talent that she would have got better for sure with or without me. Yeah. But then I wanted to test like, hey, can I help other people to get better? And so put my thoughts out there in public. That was really the initial intent. Um, and then we grew from that. You know, it was slow at first. We had 30 athletes in for a really long time and that felt amazing. It's like 30 people are paying for the programming and, <laughs> and now obviously we've grown massively since. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that that was really the beginning. Just just any, some individuals, then deciding to put it out and then just seeing it grow and, and, and we've become much more user-friendly and I've refined my thinking and I've become much more uh, understand athletes at the, who are not at the highest level. So who, who, who is it for, mate? If you take the training plan, I mean, it sounds quite high level. It started with Annie. She's winning the games. You, you, Miko's your buddy. And, you know, so who's the training plan really for? Who should be listening to the show and going, yep, I need to go and grab hold of that? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think that's a great question. I think when it comes to programming, it's really important to ask who is it for and what it's for. So, I mean, who is it for is really for anyone who is, is looking to – turn their training in CrossFit um, into a competitive sport. So it's not a GPP program. It's really geared towards sports-specific preparedness. And we start at all the way at kind of the bottom level, so to speak, and suggesting people to train four times a week, one hour at a time, and, and building the foundations, and all the way to training 10 times a week at 90, to two hour, 90 minutes to two hours at the time. So we kind of offer a spectrum of programs, yeah. Um, but really, we're looking for like that long-term development of the athletes. What kind of different programs do you guys have? Um, so we have essentially like three major divisions. So we have a foundation program, which is that kind of like four times a week plus an additional day for people who want to. Then to like a little bit more serious competitive program, which is five sessions a week, but about 90 minutes to two hours at a time. And then we have kind of a more advanced program, which is twice a day programming, five days a week uh, okay. with additional work on the rest day. So we kind of like try to cater to the athlete's training age. Yeah. And all these programs lead up to the open, regionals, games kind of season. Yeah. I mean, that's still the, in a sense, the main focus. But so many, like realistically, getting to regionals now is so difficult that for a lot of people, the Open is no longer that has the same meaning in terms of being the major competition of the season, because it's very hard to be successful in terms of qualifying. So a lot of the athletes are preparing for local competitions. Yeah, and that means that we kind of had to change our programming model at one point, and um, we look at it more from this kind of agile approach of developing these shorter blocks where we try to make meaningful progress in a certain direction and we offer different options for people to focus on their strength or their conditioning or just more like sports specific stuff yeah um and, and that's really the kind of the thinking now is that we are kind of agnostic to what you want to prepare for but we really want to provide you with the tools to make meaningful progress in the direction where you're headed cool in uh today there's so so many companies to provide training programs specifically for CrossFit athletes similar to what you're talking about what does it take to create one of the best so, sort of programs for CrossFit specifically 
Like, what separates the programs? <clears throat> well, I, you know, I think that the thing that separates the, the results, I think, which is more important, is really the athletes and the, the effort that they bring in. So what we're trying to do is not just to provide people with programming, but also help them follow the program as it's intended. So, so how they do things, I think, is even more important than what they do, as long as what they do is approximately in the right direction and doing the right things. So you, you so kind of guide them. Yeah. Yeah, we want yeah we we want to make sure that people understand what they're supposed to do in the sessions, and we provide quite a lot of notes um, for each one of the sessions, from you know setting goals to yourself to what the intent is and how to adjust the movements so that you can stay within realm of what's possible and meaningful for you that day. Um, I, I think that really that providing the how to people is 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 really the important piece. Very cool, mate. Uh, you, you said that you train as as an osteopath. You've obviously brought in like specialists to look at different areas of CrossFit and you, you mentioned there like Miko was you know able to, to, to just do workouts for a long time talk to us a little bit about the areas of specialty that you've either studied to get better at to program for people or where you've brought outside experience in and how it's impacted the program yeah absolutely I, I think I learned pretty early on it was kind of very fortunate to start working with Annie because I learned that training an athletes at that level you can't be an expert in everything that CrossFit brings to them so I learned quickly that I need to be the person who can connect the dots which yeah. means I need to have a really broad broad knowledge of most things regarding training lifestyle psychology and other things but then I can still be a specialist in few things and for me those areas of specialty really are movement looking at it from a neurological and biomechanical perspective and then that allow, gives me a kind of foundation to understand where do the different specialists fit in whether it's in weightlifting or gymnastics or any other area so um yeah, I think that's, that's the important attribute if you want to be the head coach in the sense is that you know where to go to for the information. But I think nowadays, like, you need to be great with barbell. You need to have great gymnastics. You need to have great conditioning base and understand how to move efficiently in terms of your running and swimming, etc. at the higher levels. Yeah. And then you need to be able to have a good psychology, good solid mindset. So we work with <laughs> sports psychologists, etc. to to do that. And then obviously nutrition and, and other lifestyle factors as well are important. So we work with some experts on that field as well. So, so it's quite broad. I mean, when we look at other sports like NBA or NFL or like those kind of big, big, big sports, they'll have a full coaching staff of like everything that you just mentioned, anything from a psychologist to, you know, their nutritionist to their lifestyle coach, to their running coach, the strength coach, everything. And it seems like that's quite a new thing in CrossFit that, you know, big programming companies are starting to to bring in specialists from from all different areas in order to improve the athletes to the next level, sort of. Yeah. You know, in um, 2011, um, we started having Annie work with uh, Carl Pauly and Mike Bergener, and we brought Carl kind of more closely into the team. And uh, in 2011 games, I think we were kind of the first – team behind an athlete so we had two coaches of oh, frederick was there as well so we had three coaches essentially for yeah. one athlete supporting annie and and for me that was kind of part part of the kind of the the birth of the training plan was also this this question that i had is that is there a way to one to create a professional experience for a crossfit athlete who's competing so that they have a team behind them and then two is it is it possible to scale that experience and the lessons that we learn from that to the people who are more let's call it aspirational athletes in terms of that they haven't yet broken to, to that crossfit and kids level yeah what um still talking about programming what are the common mistakes that you see in general when it comes to crossfit programming um, I mean, that's that's really broad. Do, do you think more in terms of uh, class programming? Or do you think more uh, of, in I terms of competitive? Competitive programs, such as your company, such as, you know, all the big companies, Com CompTrain and Brute Strength and all, Misfit and all that. What, what do you think or what do you see as like a general misunderstanding, a misconception that happens in programming? It could be such as high volume or too much strength or too little conditioning, etc.? Yeah, I mean, in, uh, I'd say that the, the guys you mentioned are all doing a great job with their athletes, clearly, yeah. because they're constantly qualifying for the regional games. So I, I think this maybe speaks more to the outside of that realm. But, you know, I think 
<clears throat> really focusing on that question of who is it for and what is it for is really important foundation for a good, good program. And and I think classically what we see is two things. One, we people have increased the amount of volume that they do, but they have maintained the intensity. And if you in- increase volume and you maintain intensity or increase the intensity over long periods of time, that's a really bad formula um, for athletes. So I think understanding that there's room to work at different intensities and each different intensity has a different purpose. Yeah. And if it's applied correctly and intelligently in a program, it all fits together much better than if you just always keep hammering kind of all out all out sessions regardless of what the actual intent is um, of that session. So I think that is really the one yeah. of the big things. And, and, and really doing this kind of fatigue-based training, you know, going so hard that your performance starts to decrease in the workouts, then going again and performing... <laughs> lower than the level of your current capacity would allow you to. So I think it's really important to train smart so that when you do your sessions, you include things like intervals where you can keep a high pace. You can keep kind of like a good competitive working pace, pace, but at the same time, you're working at the time durations that allow you to repeat that effort multiple times rather than kind of like get, getting tired and then practice getting more tired and then even more tired in that same <laughs> session. So yeah. I think that's one of the big mistakes that people do. I- mate, having been around uh, CrossFit since the start, mate, you've obviously seen, you know, you're obviously there when suddenly they chuck in things like a handstand walk and, you know, or take take the athletes away and make them do a triathlon. What's your thoughts on this, how CrossFit started quite broad and it just seems to be coming broader and broader and broader and testing in all these different new domains? What, what do you think about that? Well, I think if you go back to the basic premise behind CrossFit is that if the intent is to prepare you for the unknown and the unknowable, then it's only fair that the test is ever expanding. Of course, thinking of it from like a sport perspective, it's very hard to prepare for a sport that's not very well defined. (laughs) And that's of course, I mean, it it keeps it exciting for us as coaches and and programmers trying to think about it creatively (laughs) and and figure out what the next step is going to be. Right. But I think it, it really also forces you to think about what's the underlying abilities and underlying things that the athlete needs to develop so that they can be ready, even if they have to do something that they haven't tried before. Yeah. What, what do you, we've obviously seen in one of the big changes that I would say that we've seen over the last sort of five years is the inclusion of more longer events and perhaps i mean they're simply just endurance sports like you know more swimming more longer running cycling what's your thoughts on like the endurance community is obviously huge and what's the part of you know how do you feel that that's coming a lot into crossfit as well and these athletes that are very good gymnastically or weightlifting and you know in in metabolic conditioning within a crossfit environment and now being asked to do those things how do you feel about that i think it's you know, I, I, again, I think it goes back to the when you think about what's about to happen next in CrossFit, I think you have to look back and kind of look at the where did Greg Glassman come from. And one of the things, you know, he was lifting weights, he was doing gymnastics, and then he was doing these very long pieces of, of biking. And that's the foundation. So it's like right. it's, it's, not, it's not new in a sense. It's just being able to, like, look back in the history and see the patterns that will repeat themselves. So I think it's, it's, it's great because maybe more people can see a pathway to come into the sport because yeah. there is these longer events that they see in major competitions. But I think it's also really important for, for the athletes in terms of that they, they now have a context in which those longer endurance pieces or the aerobic work become, seems more relevant, even yeah. though it's always been relevant as the foundation for everything that they do. But now it's like, oh... I have to do a 60-minute event, so I better train 60 minutes sometimes. It's like, oh, that's great. So it always gives, gives me an excuse to put it in. You know, like it's easier to explain. That's very cool. Mate, you, uh, you mentioned that regionals is super, super hard to get to, which, which I know. And um, why don't you talk to us about that and what that kind of plays a role in people's motivation, like for regular people who thought that they want to go to regionals and maybe they still want to go to regionals. How should they approach this? If it's such a yeah, hard think- thing, like, do you just recommend just give up or like quit your job and start training f- five times a day or, you know, you know what I mean? You know, I, I think it's, um, I think a good way to think about it is to look around you and look at all these things that people are doing that seem absolutely incredible. So whether it's in CrossFit, whether it's, um, 
you know, someone uh, free soloing up the uh, El Capitan, you know, climbing it with no rope, no equipment, or someone jumping with a skateboard over the Great Wall of China. You know, I think it's these things seem really incredible and they seem so far fetched. But yeah. for people who do them, it's something that they do every day. It's just another day in the office. And I think that how they got there is that they had a dream of doing something crazy. But dreams are really hard to pursue because they oftentimes are not very easily measurable and you're, they're not completely under your control. But if you can take that dream of make, making the regionals and you can break that down into goals and you can break it down until you have short-term goals that you know you can accomplish and then you can break that down into daily routines and rituals and showing up in practice and training with the deliberate intent to making it that one step close to that goal, I think that's the pathway how you can make it to the regionals. I think it's good to have that as a vision or as a dream, but I think you need to focus on the day-to-day and focus on smaller competitions and build your way to earn the right to then be able to actually compete for a spot at the regionals. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think you've nailed that, mate. I think the, the last bit that you said there about earning the right, I think some people, because the Open and regionals has almost been a natural progression, people seem to think they have a right, but it's actually something that they need to earn these days and go to local competitions and experience it and, and build from there, really, don't they? Yeah, I mean, I think everybody has the right to participate, but yeah. not everybody is really competing for those spots. And the few people who are competing, they are dedicating their lives essentially to pursue that dream. Absolutely. Mate, you've been around a lot of top-level athletes. You've been an athlete yourself. One thing that w- happens to people when they go to competitions is they start to get nervous on game day. How do you deal with that, and how do you try and help your athletes to keep those nerves under control so they can perform? Yeah, I think this is really kind of individual um, in some sense, and different strategies work with different athletes. Some examples that I would use, I think one is like it's a good, good kind of reminder is that anxiety and excitement are kind of neurobiochemically very close to each other. So if, if you have someone who's very nervous, if you can get them to turn that nervousness into excitement, um, that's a really good strategy because now they can use that as a positive kind of energy and drive rather than something that's going to slow them down and, and make them maybe less coordinated in the event. Yeah. So that, that's kind of like a one, one simple thing. And, you know, oftentimes having some humor and, you know, trying to make the athletes laugh, I think is really important part of the CrossFit games, like doing something, don't, don't worry about being silly or stupid yeah. in front of them so that, you know, that they can kind of feel like it's okay that they are not perfect in that moment. Yeah. So I think that's important. I, I think another one that I really like is um, Tony Blauer um, had this nice little acronym of fear is false expectations appearing real. And I think oftentimes when athletes are very nervous, they haven't really clearly defined what they're nervous about. And I think sometimes just talking about it yeah. and name, naming that fear <clears throat> makes it so that it has much less power over you and you can feel less nervous about it. You go, like, oh, it was just this thing. It's like, that's silly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's... Oh, I, I, I think one point that I really like what you said, mate, and I, I don't see enough of that, especially in amateur sports, which for the, the mass population CrossFit is, it's just... Just sort of having a little bit of fun and realizing that if you're at a local competition, it's a Saturday or a Sunday afternoon, like you're, you're probably going to go back to work on Monday. So yeah. just smile and, you know, just enjoy it. Push as hard as you can. Leave everything on the floor, but just have a good time and be a good dude. I think, I think when CrossFit was coming up and getting a lot more competitive, it lost in certain situations with certain people. It lost a little bit of that, didn't it? Especially yeah. now leading up to the Open, huh? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean... I think people, we could all do with being more grateful, but I think just being grateful for the opportunity to be there, not like I'm grateful and I'm not going to compete. It's like, no, no, I'm grateful and I'm going to kill myself in this yeah. event because it's a privilege yeah. that I have to compete here today. I think that's the mindset where you want to get them to. Absolutely. How should people be do? How should people be training during the Open? First of all, prepping for the Open and second of all, in between the Open events. Like if we're looking at a regionals app, bubble athlete who's looking to compete at regionals or in general people who, who want to really give open a good crack you you might hit the workout friday and you might hit it again on a monday what happens on a saturday and then a sunday i think that or, yeah. or like even from a monday to a thursday i think that's a big question and everyone is sort of in doubt what to do and should i be training normal is that going to get me sore for the open etc 
Yeah, I think <clears throat> I think you have to divide that question and kind of look at. I mean, one would be what what should you be doing before the Open? I mean, if you're starting your Open preparation now, then 2019 CrossFit Games Open is a good competition to prepare for now. Hopefully for 2018, you've already done most of your preparation and now you're refining things and really kind of like fine tuning things to look more like the Open. Right. But if you are if you are prepared and now you're competing in the Open, I think it's really important to decide like what's the target this year realistically like if you know you're going to breeze through the open and you're going to get to the regionals and the regionals is going to be the big hurdle for the year then you better be training pretty hard through the open period while keeping in mind that you're going to be stressed because of the workouts and realistically almost everyone will have to do their workouts twice like there's (laughs) hardly anyone who can just do them once and even those who could do them just once psychologically because they want to win they have that mindset they will end up doing them twice. So I think you could, should prepare to say, okay, Friday and Monday, minimum, I'm going to hit this workout, depending wow. a little bit on what it is. If you can do it three times, for some people that might make sense. Wow. Most people twice, yeah. I, you know, some, some workouts, if they're very repeatable, uh, meaning that they, there's not a, like a high level of metabolic damage that's being caused by that workout, and they're more of a question of practice and finding the right strategy, then yeah. But if it's like... Um, 17.1 you know you don't want to be doing that three times like your lower back is going to be in pc so that's maybe a twice kind of thing so prepare for month i would say prepare for friday and monday for almost everyone across the board yeah yeah then, <clears throat> and what that means is that now your priority is on the performance on friday and on monday which means that whatever you need to do on saturday and sunday to be ready for the monday it's what you need to do so probably either second session on Friday if you're at that level where you do a second session or the first session on Saturday should probably be something that helps your body to recover yeah, right. from that session. And then the second session would be probably something that's going to prepare you for Monday. So that's going to be practice, trying to figure out what went well, what went wrong on the first attempt and really fine tune that. And then there is this idea when we talk about peaking of controlling your muscle tension Right. So you might have an event where you want to have your nervous system a little bit more ramped up or you want to be a little bit more mellow. So depending on that, you might do uh, something heavy if you want to kind of ramp your nervous system up. Or you might want to do something that's a little bit longer and easier intensity if you want to kind of get a little bit more mellow and kind of prime that aerobic system for a longer piece, for example. So it becomes specific to the event, what you do in those between days. But then the other side of it is what do you do on the – on the week during the week because you have to train at some point and the weekend is probably not the best time to train so now you have to do something from tuesday maybe a tuesday and wednesday and recover on thursday so then tuesday would probably be the hard day of the week giving you the maximum time to recover until you get to the until you get to the next competition day which would be on friday and then really it depends on your capacity if you could do two hard days go for it if you can only do one hard day make tuesday your hardest day of the week Make the Wednesday to be about being ready on Friday and then let the Thursday be an easier day where you might do a couple little tweaks here and there, but like take it easy. I, I think that the reality is for most people that the training is, is not going to be optimal during the Open, yeah. especially if Open is your main competition. And you should just accept that and know yeah. that the off-season is probably coming after that and that's okay. Or if you're getting ready for the regionals, then you have to find those spots like Tuesday and Wednesday where you can hit it hard. Or if you're really going gunning for it, maybe Saturday is going to be a hard day as well, still giving you one rest day before Sunday. Boom. <laughs> Interesting. What is something that you've learned and implemented in your programming from the 2017 season going into this year? I mean, 2017 obviously was kind of the year of the dumbbell. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I think... You know, every season is kind of refining the sport because of the nature of the sport being kind of defined by Dave Castro at this point. So every uh, I think every season kind of defines the sport in in different ways. And what we know now is a dumbbell is a tool that you need to be proficient in. (laughs) And it might or might not show up, but it'd be very sad if it does and you're not prepared. So we've definitely done a lot more single arm work, a lot more dumbbell work. Not that we didn't do it last year, but we definitely increased that since yeah. since the last season. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, some really, really good advice there, mate. And it sounds like, obviously, through the years, you've picked up all, all the tips and tricks. If you were to put that into one thing as advice that you've been given or that you've learned along the way that you would give to someone in CrossFit, what's the best little trick that you've picked up that you find yourself using over and over? 
<clears throat> well, <laughs> I think I think there's two things that I would say to someone. I, I think number one would be don't believe everything you think, and and I mean I mean it's so easy to have a negative mindset on yourself and your own performance and compare yourself to others and have all these weird thoughts, especially late at night, about how you're doing as an athlete. And I think it's important to put them in the context of are you hungry, are you tired, what's really affecting the way I'm thinking right now. And then the other side of that same same kind of idea of not believing everything you think is, you know, don't be complacent with the answers that you have now and be curious about what other people have thought and what kind of answers other people have and what kind of questions other people have so that you are not arrogant in what you do, um, but you're always willing to learn. I think that's really yeah, very true, the man. biggest, most important thing. Awesome. Mate, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I think a lot of people that are, you know, either at the top end or even at, at, at the sort of still at the enthusiast end of CrossFit and looking to get involved in the Open will take a lot away from, from what you've said, mate. With regards to the program, where can people find you? What's the, uh, where, the training? Is it trainingplan.co? Yeah, we we actually got the dot com now as well. So if you misspell it, it's going to be okay. Okay. Um, yeah, the trainingplan dot co is the uh, is the website. You can find us there. And we uh, we just put out this free eighteen page guide for people who are not necessarily following our programming but want to get some advice on the open. So if they want to get that, they just go on the site and they can download it easily. Awesome, awesome, mate! Congratulations for what you've achieved so far. You were you're in the sport from from the very start and. You, you can obviously see through what we've spoken about over the show that you you pretty much know your shit, mate. So congratulations for all the success that you've had and all the people that you've been able to impact. It's uh, it's it's been it's been good to watch, and we appreciate you taking the time to chat to us on the show. Thanks so much, guys. Awesome. Thank Thanks you a lot, mate. We'll catch you soon. Cheers. Cheers.